Um, my name is Deji Akomolafe. I'm a staff solution architect here at VMware. Impressive, fancy title for this is the guy who talks to customers. Okay. I, my role here at VMware is to talk to customers like you, help them understand how to virtualize specific applications on vSphere. And my name is Alex Fontana. I am a systems engineer at Facebook, which leads many to believe why the hell am I here. Um, I did actually spend nine years at VMware. Um, Deji was one of my coworkers in my last three years, where I held basically the same role, talking to customers every day. Um, and then prior to that, I was in IT operations, um, doing much of what I do now, which is actually you know, running this stuff, uh, most of it virtualized. Uh, today we are going to be talking about virtualizing, successfully virtualizing Microsoft Exchange Server on vSphere. And uh, I'm sure that since you're here this late, uh, this is what you're interested in. Alex has been doing this for years. I've been doing this for years. Uh, we do it on vSphere. We've uh, done it successfully for years. We've helped customers do it successfully for years. So if you have any questions, our hope today is to be able to address those questions. And before we get started, if you don't mind, by show of hand, how many people here have virtualized their exchange infrastructure? Oh, wow, okay. Let me rephrase that question a little bit. <laughs> how many of you have virtualized all of your exchange workload on, oh no. <laughs> uh, okay. We're in trouble. Can I rephrase it one more time? <laughs> let, let, let's, let's rephrase it. Okay, how many are here today who have not virtualized any part of your exchange infrastructure? Sluggers? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I, w I am obligated, I'm required by who you know, people that shall rename nameless, to show you this. Alex and I can guarantee you that today we are not going to talk about anything forward looking, anything that's not real, anything that uh, may reveal some sensitive secrets. We are going to help you figure out how to virtualize exchange server. That's all we are doing today, but uh, now I've done my job, so we can um, skip this. We are going to talk about virtualizing exchange server. We're going to have you listen to or read what the experts say about virtualizing Exchange Server. We are going to then answer the question, okay, so the experts say we can do that, but why should we do it? Maybe some justification for doing it. We're going to answer the question that's on your mind. Is it supported? Some of the people who have not virtualized today may be asking that same question, is it supported? We are going to answer that question. We are going to do, go through some common configuration considerations. We are going to talk about availability and disaster recovery because when you virtualize uh, applications like Exchange and other critical applications, you are not so much interested in consolidation and how much you can get into a part into one ESX host. You are more concerned about will it perform and can I ensure availability? Those are the two primary drivers for virtualizing critical application like Exchange on vSphere. We talk to customer, we know that. We're going to help you answer that. Um, then we're going to let you know that if you do virtualize it, you will not be the first one doing it, you will not be the only one doing it. Uh, who else is doing it? We'll show you some uh, references. Then we're going to answer some of the questions that uh, you get, you find in the field when you're trying or you determining or trying to decide whether or not you want to virtualize. Should we, should we stay physical? Isn't that good enough? We will get into those common questions. And then we're going to go into, all right, somebody told me X, Y, Z. We will try and debunk some of the myth of uh, virtualizing exchange server. Alex is here as somebody who actually runs exchange in production on vSphere for some large organization that uh, you probably will be familiar with. And this is going to give you uh, a, an overview of how they did it. Everybody okay? We will take questions. If you do have pressing questions, um, the microphones are here. 
please ask them. We will prefer that you keep the questions until we've gone through the PowerPoint, uh, death by PowerPoint, but we will try not to kill you. So let's start with the case for virtualizing Exchange Server. Give you a little bit of time to follow this. Executive summary, it's only available at all time. Rapidly scale up and down, whichever way you want to. Um, as IT, as demand for Exchange increases, um, IT are figuring out that virtualizing it actually improves not just the efficiency, not just the operation, but also the availability, agility, and resiliency of the exchange infrastructure when they virtualize it. This is not coming from me and it's not coming from Alex. It's not coming from my legal department. They're not asking me to give you some fluff here. This is coming from the experts, the people who own Exchange Server, Microsoft. The Microsoft Exchange team also, shall we say, bless virtualizing Exchange Server. Since Exchange Server 2010, SP1, Microsoft has supported virtualizing every component, every role of Exchange. This is their take on whether or not virtualization is good. Let's take it one more step further. If you go online and look at the Microsoft Cloud Assessment Tool for Messaging Infrastructure, you will see when you plug in the metrics they ask of you and you put in some numbers as to the number of mailboxes that you are envisaging, you're thinking of virtualizing, they'll spit out this scorecard, which if you look closely, private cloud is deemed by Microsoft to be the best option for virtualizing exchange infrastructure once you start getting to scale, okay? Private cloud to us is vSphere infrastructure on-premise, and that's what Microsoft is blessing here. So we are letting you hear from the expert what they think of virtualizing an exchange infrastructure. We think exchange is a viable solution. When you virtualize it, you get complementary availability, enhancement of load balancing, scalability, simplified operation, rapid provisioning of mailboxes or any other roles, and it just accelerates your deployment and enhances your business continuity. We will show you an example of how we complement the native high availability and resilience in exchange with the features of vSphere uh, infrastructure. I'm going to let Alex answer that question. Why, why? Why virtualize it, right? Um, well, what's the case for virtualizing it? So obviously, if, if we were you know, doing this presentation back in 2007, 2008, performance would have been you know, the, the very top of where our concerns were. Um, from our perspective, we've pretty much put those concerns aside. Um, there were scenarios back then where we would have uh, deployed a little differently or maybe told you to do something to not as grand a scale as you could do today. Um, that's pretty much all gone, right? There's been numerous enhancements with vSphere, obviously with Exchange 2013, the reduction in I.O., the, the changes to the database um, that have pretty much wiped out our any concerns that we have around performance. Um, the times that we do see something like Exchange, which is performance hungry, right? It's very CPU, very memory, and to a certain degree, somewhat IO intensive. Um, the instances where we do see issues um, are not necessarily because of the underlying hypervisor. Um, perhaps there's some um, uh, calculations that weren't made right. You know, people go off and try to use the Exchange storage calculator and put in the wrong numbers, put in wrong pro processor spec ratings, uh, don't size the backend storage appropriately. That's typically where we see the issues come up, but we've seen the improvements in Exchange, we've seen the improvements in vSphere. Um, they're more than capable, uh, the vSphere platform is more than capable of running those workloads. Uh, not such a big issue in 2013, but it, it's still there, more so 20, uh, 2010, the consolidation of roles. All right, uh, one of the big things that Microsoft tries to, to push out there as an architecture is if you're gonna deploy Exchange, you wanna consolidate the roles. Um, simply because it, if, if for no other reason, it allows you to use that hardware 
to the most uh, of its capabilities. We do this in vSphere by not necessarily combining the roles into a single OS, but by placing other workloads onto the same physical hardware, right? So I might size a VM, a mailbox VM, to run at 60 or 70 or 80% peak, which means I've had a failover scenario, but during normal, you know, just normal course of the business day, I might only be running at 20, 30%. What's the rest of that hardware that, that ESX host doing at that time? Well, it can run other workloads, assuming that I'm taking advantage of things like DRS. In a physical environment, that is really just wasted, wasted uh, power, right? Um, in our environment, we always try to run the physical hardware up at around 70 and 80% um, because it doesn't make sense for us not to, right? And then the last thing, obviously, I've, I've touched on that is utilizing the hardware as efficiently as possible. Left the clicker. So, again, I'm, I'm going to go back in time and say one of the biggest concerns has always been support. Uh, this, none of this should be news, right? Exchange uh, has been supported on a SVVP hypervisor which vSphere was the first third-party hypervisor to, to be on that list since Exchange 2007. Um, from 2010 SP1 and on, every single role has been supported to be virtualized. Some of them with some caveats, mainly the unified messaging role, but every other role can absolutely be virtualized with really no other caveats. Um, there are things like some storage considerations that we'll get into in a bit, but uh, for all intents and purposes, the support is there. Um, and, and perhaps you're not a premier customer, that's fine because you're covered by SVVP. Um, and the very last bullet here, if you are a VMware customer and you have VMware support, you can pick up the phone and call VMware and VMware will use TSANet to uh, open a back channel communication with Microsoft if in fact that needs to happen. If for some reason um, you go into Microsoft or you go into VMware, you, th that issue is not being resolved, uh, VMware can open a case up on their end to get this resolved that way. Okay, now that we've talked about support, you know you can virtualize it, there are certain things you need to put into, take into consideration when you're virtualizing the Exchange server, and this is not just for Exchange, it's uh, actually any critical application. Uh, you will have some consideration when you start talking to Microsoft as to the supportability of virtualizing an exchange uh, if a workload. One of the things you will hear very often is dynamic memory support. They will tell you exchange does not support dynamic memory and that is true. They are the experts. You hear them say uh, what they said about virtualization. One thing you can take away from here is dynamic memory is not a construct on vSphere platform. We do, not, we do not take memory away from a running VM. So when Microsoft or when you hear anybody say, oh, you can virtualize Exchange because of dynamic memory or don't use dynamic memory and you start looking around and say, where do I disable dynamic memory in vSphere? That doesn't exist in vSphere, okay? There's, Exchange, a reason, there's a reason it's in quotes, right? That's the reason it's enclosed, because it's a concept that is foreign to vSphere. You will not have to worry about that. Exchange recovery requires code boot. You will hear some people still tell you today, 2014, that, oh, you don't use HA or DRS or vMotion with an exchange workload because we need to do code boot. Well, when you migrate an exchange workload, it's not going down, it's, a, it, it's, in, it's simply, it's working, it's running, so there, that doesn't affect, uh, impact uh, anything about code boot. When you do HA, when HA restarts an exchange VM, maybe the ESXO starts fail or you took it out of service, that exchange VM is coming off from code boot. So we satisfy this requirement. Exchange role calculator, the sizing row sizing tool, which is the calculator, is what every, if you're not doing it, you should be doing it. Every exchange administrator use that as a baseline to size the exchange VM that will accommodate their uh, mailboxes. We support you using that calculator. It is your starting point. You need to factor in the fact that the calculator is very generous in its requirement. It always asks for more than you actually need. 
in speaking with customers in our own lab testing, in our own engineering testing, we've discovered that the numbers and the requirements specified by the exchange calculator is overly, overly aggressive. And we've seen customers who get a calculator that recommends 16 vCPUs run that same exchange server with eight CPUs or even 10 and have the same performance that the calculator expects. So when you use the calculator, please always bear in mind that it is generous, it is aggressive. We recommend that you do it. Now, how can you, how can you know whether or not you've oversized an exchange VM? These are the things that you can really easily, easily um, use to baseline or to test or to watch for CPU over allocation for an example, the cost stop will lead, will show you whether or not um, we are fairly using the CPU, we're fairly scaling the CPUs to its optimum. If you see this thing go up, you will have an indication that you've given this VM too much CPUs. NFS storage is not supported by Microsoft for one reason or the other. We mirror that same requirement. We tell you not to use NFS for exchange. It's not or VMware specific, it's a Microsoft impos uh, imposition. PV SCSI, Power Virtualized SCSI, is an adapter, it's a storage adapter that you can use inside vSphere. It is the latest and the greatest SCSI controller that we have on vSphere platform. It has larger queue depth, it uses less processor, it's faster, you can pipe more IO traffic through a sing one single PV SCSI adapter than you could do with LSI SAS. We have only we have one little caveat against that. If you're going to do exchange DAG, which relies on Windows failover cluster, we do not currently support using PVSCSI with Windows failover cluster. We do not support it officially. It is not due to a defect. It is not because of any performance issue or any technical issue. It is just because we haven't yet gotten into the process of publishing a clear support statement on that. It hasn't gone through the official QA process. If you're using it, if you want to use it, your VMware account people can get, take you through the process of getting official qualification for your configuration. Right now, you will not find a document from VMware that make a statement as to PVS because it's been supported for DAG. Just be conscious of that. A snapshot, of course, one of the things that people like about virtualization is the ability to, be, to take snapshots of a VM, do whatever they need to do on the VM, destroy it, kill it, whatever, and be able to revert to a previous state and get a good VM. Do not do that with an exchange VM. Because you're rolling back in time, exchange is database, transactional based, and all that, when you roll back an exchange VM to a previous state, you've lost a lot of transactions. You will impact your databases. If you are using hardware-based VSS snapshot, your storage vendor or your backup vendor will tell you whether or not they require that, whether they do snapshot. Snapshots taken from the backup solution or the hardware-based snapshot, those are supported. What is not supported is the one you go into a vCenter client and right-click on the VM and say, take a snapshot. We do not support that. It will cripple your exchange infrastructure. Do not do it. Hyperthreading is one of the things that you will hear from Microsoft that you should never ever enable for an exchange uh, infrastructure. I would clearly like to dispel that the, 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 the reasoning behind that. It is not because hyperthreading hurts exchange per se. There is a, a corner case that I'll talk about. What happens is when you enable hyperthreading, you will surface double the amount of physical CPU cores available on the, on the physical hardware in vSphere. If you have a 32 core hardware and you enable hyperthreading, you will see 64 cores in vSphere. If you are the type of administrator who is not aware of your physical architecture, you will go crazy allocating 64 CPUs to VMs. Those 64 CPUs do not exist. Enabling hyperthreading does not double your physical cores. However, if you enable hyperthreading, 
the hypervisor, the vSphere hypervisor benefits from the extra slacks in, uh, surfaced by the hyperthreading hyper course. We recommend that we enable hyperthreading and size your exchange infrastructure such that you're only allocating CPUs based on the actual physical course. Don't use the hyperthreading course to size your infrastructure. In Exchange 2013 on Hyper-V, Exchange 2013 will see the actual cost if you enable hyperthreading, and it will, the garbage collector will then allocate memory based on those hyperthreading cores. That is not an issue on the, hyper, uh, the vSphere layer because the Exchange VM does not know how many physical cores you have on that hardware. Even if you enable hyperthreading, the only thing the Exchange VM will see is whatever you've given it. It would not allocate memory based on the totality of cores available on the physical hardware or the totality of the hyperthreaded cores. Yeah, and, and if performance is a, is a concern, I think that because you're running on a system that has hyperthreading enabled, uh, vSphere is intelligent enough to understand that if this VM, if this vCPU needs to use more than the, the allocation that the hyperthread allows, it will overrun that whole processor core um, and basically not be hyperthreading. So size to the physical cores, enable hyperthreading, ESX can totally make use of those uh, of the uh, available threads there. So more things that you need to know. Um, you should definitely be using VMXNet. Just as Deji mentioned with the para-virtualized SCSI controller, this is a para-virtualized network controller. It's made to be run on a virtual machine. Um, the CPU utilization at the hypervisor level is lower than you would get with the E1000. Um, it's not a legacy driver like the E1000. Obviously, the E1000 is nice because you install Windows or you install whatever OS you're running, and it's there. Um, get VMware tools on there. Change that to the VMXNet, and you'll probably, eh, potentially in a large exchange environment, you know, maybe see a little better throughput, but you'll definitely see lower hypervisor level CPU utilization. This is one that uh, when, when I was meeting with customers a bunch and I'd sometimes get called in because there was performance issues, this is one of the first things I'd always check. Was the customer using multiple virtual SCSI adapters? And I don't care if you're using LSI, I don't care if you're using PV SCSI. Um, did the customer do the, uh, the, the point and click, next, 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 and end up with you know, 30 drives across two SCSI controllers? Uh, that was typically the case unless they came and saw one of these or heard me and Deji harp on about why it was a, the worst thing you could do to your environment. Um, if you're going to have four or more drives, volumes, LUNs attached to your virtual, any server really, but to your mailbox server, you've got to start using multiple virtual SCSI controllers. You get four, use all of them. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the same as you know, what's going to happen is these doors are going to fling open and all of us are going to try to go through one door once we open four doors, everything flows a lot smoother. Um, it's basically the same premise there. Those virtual SCSI controllers are still just drivers within the OS, right? There's still a queue depth that, has, that is maintained within that driver. If you're using LSI, the LSI, you have, it's a queue depth of 32 by default. PV SCSI has a queue depth of 64 by default, but you're essentially quadrupling that for your IO, somewhat IO intensive, but definitely IO latency sensitive workload, which uh, is Exchange. If you're like us, and by us I mean, I mean my company, Facebook, what we do is we don't have specialized islands of vSphere. Um, it's kind of an administrative nightmare, but people do it because Exchange is a, is a business critical app, and if it goes down, um, someone's gonna come and you know, be right in my ass until I get it back. And performance, I'm really scared of that being hindered, so we're gonna build this isolated cluster. We don't do that. We build these huge clusters and we throw everything in the mix um, and we can't build that environment and manage it without being able to use things like vMotion, without being able to use DRS. Um, so a few of the things that you need to keep in mind when using vMotion along with DAG or vMotion along with whatever latency, you know, VMs that talk to each other um, that can go down if they stop talking to each other. Uh, one of the things is First of all, you would want to start using multiple port groups for your vMotion network. 
Uh, starting in vSphere 5, VMware gave you the capability to assign multiple IP addresses for vMotion use, multiple um, kernel ports for vMotion use. When assigned to multiple port groups and when configured correctly, vMotion will actually just go and start utilizing that extra bandwidth. Uh, what we saw was about a 25% increase in the throughput, and we actually saw that when we vMotion DAG members without this setting, the DAG didn't fall over, but we had database failovers, right? So as an administrator, you come in the next day and all your databases are over here, or this one machine is not doing anything. Um, when we started enabling these settings, specifically the multiple vMotion port groups, we saw those database failovers go away. Uh, the other one on the list was enabling jumbo frames. That one is a bit harder because obviously you don't control that from end to end, right? You might have to go and talk to a network administrator um, and get all the get jumbo frames enabled at every layer that you may cross uh, between hosts. But we did see it uh, actually solve the problem as well. And then the last one, which is another easy one, which you might as well just do, is increasing the, the same subnet or the cross subnet delay, depending on how your, your environment's set up. Um, we saw that enabling the same subnet delay, uh, so obviously our DAG members were on the same subnet, enabling that to 2,000 milliseconds would allow us to get past that vMotion stun, which is gonna happen no matter, no matter how fast your vMotion network is. Um, it would allow us, that one setting also allowed us to get past that stun and not have the, the failovers that we saw prior to that. This is, the, 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 the memory allocation one is one that I didn't used to talk about a whole lot until I had to go back and start supporting a pretty large environment. Um, if you are gonna allocate 90, 70, 72, 96 gigs of RAM to your mailbox VM, even if you're running separate CAS and hubs and you're gonna allocate you know, 16, 32 gigs of RAM to those guys, do yourself a favor and reserve the memory. Um, you know, you, if you go to the SQL uh, session, that's probably one of the first bullets on, on performance and things that you should do right off the bat. Um, I'm glad that Deji went ahead and made that always uh, all caps because that is probably one of the most important things and things that's just gonna save your ass in the long run, right? When something fails, when one host fails and you have all these other VMs come in and start encroaching on your memory, um, this is, the exchange servers are the ones that people are gonna call about. So just go ahead and, and make sure that that memory is reserved and do not set any limits. Uh, and you might not set them knowingly. Um, there used to be a bug within vSphere where a limit would be set and you wouldn't find out until you saw the excessive paging. Uh, that bug doesn't exist anymore, but just make sure that you're aware that setting limits, even if, you, if the limit set is to the allocated memory, is still a pretty bad thing. And then finally, another question that still gets asked a lot is, should I go VMFS? or should I go RDM? I know Exchange is you know, IO intensive and, and it's latency sensitive. Which one should I do? Uh, the fact of the matter is, since about ESX 301, the performance differences between RDM and VMFS have been negligible. And I mean, we're talking you know, microseconds and, and very little IO difference. Today, the main reason we would, uh, or any Deji would say, go this way or go that way is really based on your hardware vendor, right? Are, are you using some capability within your storage array where you're required to present that physical raw device up to the VM, right? A, a good example of that is array-based snapshots, right? If, if you have uh, all of your exchange databases on an array and you want to use the built-in capabilities of the array to back up and restore your databases, chances are pretty good that you're going to have to have some agent within the VM and that agent has to talk directly to the underlying storage. RDMs are typically required for that. Prior to vSphere 5.5, we would have said, well, if you want to go with volumes above two terabytes, you need to use physical mode RDMs. Today, as long as you're not going over 62 terabytes, you can stay with VMFS um, if you have no other hardware restrictions. Exchange itself is a very good product with local or native high availability and resilience built in. We do not dispute that. The native availability and resiliency feature in vSphere complement the native availability in 
exchange. And we combine that with DRS to give you an unmatched and complete availability, optimal re uh, resource utilization that is not possible in the physical implementation. Let's take an example. You have two mailboxes configured in DAG. DAG is very good at bringing databases up on the passive node. If one of uh, the physical mailbox server goes down, DAG will continue, will bring this database up here and continue to service client requests. There is no downtime. However, in that condition and in that state, you will need to go service this mailbox server that's down. You will need to go fix whatever is wrong with it, memory or anything, replace CPU. While you're doing that, your DAG on this side is unprotected. If anything happens within that period, your DAG is gone. Your mailbox availability is gone. Clients are not able to access anything. If you complement this with vSphere HA in a virtualized infrastructure, we take the same two DAG scenario, one of the ESX server goes down. What happens is instantaneously, vSphere HA will restart the Exchange Mailbox server, VM, that, is, that was on that ESX host. DAG has already done its thing. Service availability is continuous. vSphere HA brings up this dead VM really quickly, and it joins the DAG again. Now you have protection while the ESX host is still down. That is what complementing the availability option inside vSphere with the native exchange availability option gives you higher availability at, without administrative intervention. You would not need to go do anything for that VM to be powered on by HA. Here is an example. We have a three cluster ESX host and we have uh, the mailbox servers configured in DAG and one of the ESX hosts goes down. What is going to happen is we will instantaneously restart all the VMs on that dead server and they will come up, join DAG. DAG will be continuously protected at uh, less, less within five minutes without you actually doing anything. One of the things I'll point out here, though, is um, if you read the best practices that VMware publishes, in, a, in an optimal environment, we would size the vSphere cluster to be DAG nodes plus one. All right, so if your DAG has five nodes, the best case scenario is that you have at least six ESX hosts so that when one of them fails, you can ret uh, restore that VM on a host where there is not another DAG member of the same DAG. If you run multiple DAGs, not an issue. Okay, we've talked about DAG, <clears throat> in our opinion DAG, or even from Microsoft, the first thing DAG does is provide local availability, high availability. Now let's talk about disaster recovery, where you have a whole site disaster. If the two nodes of DAG are in this production site, your primary site, and the site goes down for any reason, you do not have recovery option unless you're doing a multi-site DAG implementation. Now, in this scenario, you could have exchange spread across multiple sites and rely on the exchange native site resilience capability to have service continuity when a site goes down, catastrophic failure of the primary site. It requires a lag database copy to protect from corruption, one, and when you activate it, they do not provide instant HA. You will have to reseed the databases. Now, in, an, in a production environment, your databases are usually maybe hundreds of gigabytes of data. In a, in a disaster event, relying on the native resiliency available for DAG, you will have hours of hours of reseed operation going on before you can get into a protected state. If you leverage Site Recovery Manager, which is one of the things available from a VMware, I do not sell products, so I will not speak much about Site Recovery Manager. However, 
if you complement your local availability with this opportunity, with this product, what happens is you will have an exact replica of your exchange infrastructure at your secondary site. You can pre-program your recovery steps. You can test your recovery ste uh, uh, steps. You can validate your recovery. You can simulate a real disaster event. You can see what happens, how long it will take, what operations and what tasks need to be performed. You can pull in callouts. You can script it. You can call PowerShell or do anything to go configure your load balancer or your network configuration without bringing down your production environment. You can call in your auditors, your stakeholders, and say, watch this. Push a button, simulate a disaster, and people are still accessing their mailboxes in production. You cannot do that with the exchange native resilience op uh, option. Now, what happens is you've pre-programmed the recovery um, steps. In a real disaster, you can be assured that whatever you've pre-programmed in there is what is going to happen when you do an actual recovery with Site Recovery Manager. That is all I'm going to say about that. All right, um, this is you. Sure. So, so this is a pretty typical scenario. Um, two local copies, that pro provides our HA, right? One third copy in a remote site for DR. Why do you need a third site? In a, a second site, sorry. No, you do need a third the, site. The recovery site. Yeah. Um, so assume we have a, a complete site failover, or fight failure. What we have to do is run through a set of steps. In this scenario, chances are we've lost quorum, which means that we basically have to rebuild the cluster. Uh, there's commands that are out of the box with Exchange uh, 2010 and 2013 that you could run to basically break the cluster down, rebuild the cluster, reestablish quorum, and be able to get your databases back online. It's a fairly trivial process if you've gone through it. But when you're in the moment and you're having to go to TechNet or go through your notes and figure out exactly what that process was or why this one database isn't coming up or why the file share witness isn't available, um, it can be a little stressful. But again, with practice, this works absolutely fine. This is what we do. This is what I do. What Deji would tell you is that this is a whole lot simpler. Because in this scenario, you're actually replicating the whole environment. So you're replicating your one or two or three or four nodes, um, however no many nodes you have in your DAG. You're replicating your file share witness. And in the case of a failover, you, again, go and push that button because you've pre-programmed, pre-scripted this into your run book that's being held within SRM. And when you get everything done, you get your VM up, you're able to run the scripts which will re-IP your DAG if you needed to re-IP a DAG, re-IP the, the VMs if you needed to do that, establish quorum, and then be able to bring uh, databases back online. I have, I have it one. Was, yeah, go ahead, sorry. I have one thing to add to that. Uh, I mentioned the reseed. Um, watch closely. Over here, everything is replicated. You have the DAG configuration all in there. If in, in the event of a site disaster, when you bring up this other side, your DAG is there. There is no reseed that needs to happen before you have DAG protection. And in the native site resilience option with Exchange, imagine you have a two node DAG cluster or DAG nodes, and there is the file share witness. Let's say you put one of the nodes on the recovery site, but the file witness is at the primary site. You need three votes, or you have three votes. In a three vote scenario, you need at least two to form a quorum. Now, imagine the production site where your file share witness and the active DAG node have gone down. You do not have the ability to recover that single DAG because the witness is gone. That's why, usually, in this native resilience option, you would need a third site to put the witness somewhere that will not be impacted because you don't want the majority of the quorum set to be in one side. With SRM, you don't fall into that situation. And the, the reseed thing is actually really important too because in, in many situations, if you actually do have a disaster, you're probably gonna be living out of that DR facility for a while. Um, you know, imagine the, the divergence that happens over that period of time. And as, as much as 
you know, the, the, the marketing stuff goes and says, well, you know, we can, we, we can catch up to that. Um, you need to take into consideration how much log space do you have, right? You're going to have to keep on holding on to those logs if you really want to try and catch up. And when you do try to catch up, good luck. Chances are you're going to have to reseed, and you're going to be reseeding do, during, uh, using the, the native um, file copy technology that Exchange uses. Um, something like SRM typically relies on array-based replication, and typically those solutions have compression built in and WAN acceleration and all that, but something to consider. I promise that we will let you know that <clears throat> when you do virtualize your exchange infrastructure, you would not be the one doing the dog footing. <laughs> People are doing it. Enterprise level customers are doing it. We've been virtualizing exchange since 2007, even before Microsoft started officially supporting it. We've gotten the science down. Uh, we know how to do it. And uh, Alex uh, did the Facebook one with his eyes closed, is what he told me. Okay, people are doing exchange virtualization, and we have we publish white papers and prescriptive guidance on what to do and what not to do when you virtualize your exchange infrastructure. Available on VMware.com. Now let's talk about the common things that you will hear, the common objections you will hear when you're considering virtualizing an exchange server. Okay, scale. Uh, you can use DAS. You don't need. Uh, sign because exchange doesn't require much storage io it's true but when you start getting up to a certain amount of mailboxes and number of servers uh, mailbox servers if you are attaching that jboard to each of those servers you just com uh, complicate your administrative overhead because now you have multiple that's a jboard to manage instead of managing everything centrally in through the sign almost i would say Almost every one of you has a, a, a sign implementation somewhere, and this is what you use for your critical applications. Why would you go attach JBoard and DAS to your Exchange virtual uh, uh, Exchange servers? Availability and protection. Um, backing up JBoard, the receipt is also another problem. Backing up JBoard is complicated. It's not that alone doesn't protect uh, against failure. This is one of the reasons, the failure rate of a DAS, JBoard uh, architecture, is one of the reasons why Microsoft recommends that you have four copies, a minimum of four copies of DAG when you're doing physical implementation of Exchange. Four copies, that's four times the amount of storage that you actually need. Um, replication, well, there's really no good way to replicate a DAS or NAS. It's a complicated process. Um, virtualization is actually blocked when you're using DAS or JBoard. You can't do that inside vSphere. You may want to say, okay, let's look at vSign, which is an, an option that we are not going to talk about here, but you will be prevented from virtualizing on vSphere if all you have is J, uh, JBoard or DAS. <clears throat> The operational cost, the security, and the performance are some of the reasons why people like Wikibon, the expert at Wikibon, tell you that once you're getting above a 500, 1,000 mailbox configuration, the cost-benefit analysis or the cost-benefit number published by some people I would not name do not make sense anymore. You do not get the cost benefit anymore getting above certain number of mailboxes and certain number of mailbox servers. You still get people say, okay, why do I need to virtualize my users? Have their heavy users and uh, they have large mailboxes and uh, my mailbox servers are really, really large and uh, I will, I'm going to use all the physical hardware so why do I need to virtualize? Well, you can't really run an exchange server mailbox on what on the hardware that you will procure today, the two by twelve or the two by uh, two by ten or even the forty-eight cores, because there is a limit imposed by Microsoft on how big a, a single mailbox server can be. VSphere 5.5 has improvement in sizes. Alex mentioned 62 terabytes, one, uh, 62 terabytes of, uh, 
of a VMFS, one terabyte of memory, we can accommodate however large the mailbox server needs to be. And you will not be able to use all those resources for a single mailbox server role. Even when you combine it with CAS in 2013, or you combine it with CAS and up transport in 2010. If you combine the roles, Microsoft imposed a limitation on how much of the actual resources you can use in production. The number is here. That they're flexible. Yes, they're flexible. Uh, but virtualization is flexible. Okay. So we'll, we'll go through this. I won't. All right. Um, with DAG, I don't get any performance. Yes, you do. We've demonstrated that with DAG, you have continuous availability and more protection for the DAG infrastructure itself if you complement that with vSphere HA, where we can restart a VM without your administrative intervention. We can make your DAG more available. I'm already consolidating exchange and uh, CAS, and I don't need to virtualize it because I'm going to use all the hardware. You're not going to be able to use all the hardware. There will be slack. In steady state, you will be wasting at least 40% of the actual processor and power, uh, computing, compute power inside that single server. The benefit of virtualization is that you can reuse resources and when VMs or workloads don't demand those resources, they can be used for something else. So I, I figured since I'm here, I'll just I'd give a quick overview of what we do. And, and a lot of this probably looks very similar because that's kind of the whole point of this, right? It's, it's virtualizing exchange is not a big deal. It's getting the exchange administrators or, or yourself just to, to get over that hump of thinking that you can't do it. it it's probably the best thing you could do from a management administration perspective, at least in my opinion. So we run vSphere 5.5. We run v, uh, Exchange 2010 SP3 um, and have no intention of going to 2013. If you want to listen to why, you can come talk to me after. Uh, we have very non-specific numbers here. We have tens of thousands of mailboxes. We have tens of terabytes of uh, mailbox data bits floating around. We do have kind of a hybrid deployment. So we have a primary, well, we had a primary data center that's on the West Coast. That's about half physical, uh, half of the mailbox servers are physical. The, all of the client access hub transport servers are virtual and we have a crap load of them because we use EWS like it's going out of business, right? With tons of Macs, everybody has three active sync devices. Um, and so we, we really annihilate these boxes. Uh, we have engineers that like to write these really cool tools that we use internally, um, but what do they do? They hit every CAS server, they hit the load balancer every minute to suck everyone's calendaring information because um, it, it, the, the tools are cool, but you know, wreaks havoc. Um, the East Coast Data Center is 100% virtualized and we're going for an active, active scenario here. Um, our DAG setup is not what you would see being recommended by Microsoft because uh, from the literature, a DAG is a unit of administration, right? And, and a DAG is a pain in the ass to administer. Not really. Um, the way that we saw it is if I were to deploy an eight node DAG, right? I, I have a, a, an upper limitation of how many mailboxes I can throw on there, both given the size of mailboxes that I want to support and the number of mailboxes that I, the number of mailboxes that I want to support in it. What happens when I hit that limit? Well, I have a few options. If I'm physical, probably the only thing I can do is slap another DAG node on there or another few, uh, maybe add some storage. But if I'm deploying per Microsoft recommendation of going with a, a symmetrical database distribution where every DAG node supports every other DAG node in some way, um, I've really messed myself up and I'm gonna have to do a lot of reseeding, a lot of reshuffling of databases. What we chose to do was say, you know what? We're gonna deploy this, this two active and one passive copy so we get our DR, we get our high availability, and we're just gonna make that a building block. This is gonna support X number of users. Um, if for some reason we wanna support more in that building block, we can add more vCPUs, we can add more disks to the VMs up to the limits that VMware allows. Um, but that's our building block. And it's really easy for us to spin up three VMs, two in one data center, two in another, and just keep iterating that way. Why does it make sense for us? So we occasionally get 
uh, inundated with like a thousand interns in the summer. Um, we might buy a company that has, I don't know, a few hundred mailboxes, and things happen really quickly, and we need to react really quickly. Um, getting physical hardware in a data center uh, for the production side of the house, that's probably very easy for them. And, and they're you know, a completely automated shop. Um, people go in, slap a box in, and in five minutes it's up and running. It doesn't really work that way with Exchange, and, and definitely not in IT as a whole. Um, but this is, this is our first step to really be able to be, uh, to getting to be as flexible as we can. Um, not so much for the mailbox servers, but for the client access and hub transport servers, which I said we, we tend to spin up a lot of and, and sometimes even tear down. Um, we have that automated. Uh, we use Chef to deploy those boxes, and we can spin up a new VM or a set of VMs in a matter of minutes. Um, virtualization obviously is, is a big key there. And, and then none of us is at a data center, right? Uh, the, the days are pretty much long gone where uh, I can run into the, to the computer room and go fix something. Uh, there's nowhere for me to run to except, you know, get some coffee, go to the bathroom. But everything I need is right there in front of me um, simply because we're, we're running on vCenter. This is a, a very uh, nondescript picture, but it's, it's exactly how we run. We have three node DAGs, a lot of, a lot of virtual machines, um, and uh, it's, been, it's been working pretty splendidly. I think we've left about nine, eight or so minutes uh, for questions. There's a couple mics. Um, I'm sure there's stuff that we didn't cover because we could go on for a long time talking about the nuts and bolts. But if you have specific questions, come on up to the mic and we'll, we'll do our best to, to address those questions while we're being recorded. And then we'll probably get kicked out and we can answer more questions there. But and feel now, free to come up to the mics. I, I thank you all. We thank you all for being here. It has been a very great talking to you.